Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I, you know, um, I, I stand um, in a kind of um, uh, astonishment at the historical situation uh, that we're listening to this uh, extraordinary speech uh, by this brave uh, martyr of, of, of uh, international black freedom, um, that I'm hearing it for the first time by design. And um, I think a couple of things uh, struck me. Um, I made a, a whole raft of notes. I wouldn't have time to go through them, so I'm just going to trust my first blaze of, 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 of feeling. Um, and I think the first thing that struck me was the incredible incandescent courage and clarity of, of the man. Um, I think that following that, the next thing that struck me was the great loss to America. The profound loss to America and to the worldwide struggle of black people um, today and for the last 50 years. We, we have desperately needed uh, uh, a champion, a thinker, a courageous thinker like that. He seems to me to exemplify something very powerful that, that Bob Marley said and that Bob Marley probably got from his spirit, which is, you know, um, you free yourself from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds. My, I, I think sitting at the back there, what struck me is the clarity with which he says what is absolutely basic about black condition in America and in Britain and in the world today, which is that there can be no negotiation with the basic and fundamental freedom of all peoples. Um, I think this speech came at a great turning point in his life when he just come from, from, from Mecca and um, he, he was making like a, a change from one kind of radicalism to a new kind of international radi radicalism. And I, I think this is the most potent phase of, of his life as we know it because he was embracing the struggles of black people and colored peoples all over the world. It was, it was a new kind of struggle. It had not been done before. He was moving closer to Martin Luther King in a kind of fundamental agreement with the, the, the necessity for a radicalism of freedom. His view um, is, is that moderation is, 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 is a failure of will. Um, and that what is needed when it comes to fundamental liberty is the very extremism, and I, 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 I found it very interesting the way he de deconstructed the word extremism, um, and deconstructed the way in which the press, the Western press, tends to use that word extremism to limit uh, the, the, the voice of anybody who is trying to speak for freedom. Um, I think it's a message all of his messages that he has to say is current. We still need it. Um, we have not made any great evolution since 1964. There have been moderate changes here and there, but in my visit to America, I feel that the fundamental condition he's speaking about is still there. It is visible in the way that uh, uh, President Obama is treated. It is visible in Alabama, it is visible in the South. All you have to do is walk across America. It is also visible here in England. I think. Radical voices about black freedom need to be raised in England. We had a great moment in the 60s because of his great impetus, and it sort of got diminished and lost in the 70s and in the 80s, and now I think we're, struck, we're stuck with a kind of moderation. Um, how am I doing for time? Uh, how many more minutes have I got? Four. Um, I think the other thing that... Four, five. I think the other thing that struck me um, very strongly was um, when he talks about the yardstick of those in power. And he's absolutely right. Um, one set of people in power say, well, this is the proper way to do things. This is the only way. And those who are victims of that power, well, they perceive it differently. Um, so I think the way in which he analyzed power in the form of uh, um, um, extremism. And I think another thing that struck me was I loved his passion. I loved the, 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 the mood of the, the audience. Clearly, it was a time in which the students felt a tremendous sympathy with that fundamental struggle. They found his political statements humorous. I, th I, th I thought that was very interesting. I was fascinated by the, the keen sense of electric um, 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 mood 
in, 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 the, in, the, in the hall. The, purely from a formal point of view, I also found very interesting the transition from audio, when we just heard the voices and you couldn't hear it very clearly, to when suddenly you saw the man. An extraordinary clarification of the man and of his voice suddenly happened when he went from voice to, or, uh, to, to visual. And the question I want to ask is this, why the hell did the BBC only film 12 minutes? Of what, of what will turn out to be one of the great historical speeches of the 60s? I mean, what were they thinking? Um, did they suddenly get a call in the middle of the speech? Someone said, um, I think maybe we should film this. Um, hello? Um, so that, that, was, that, was, that, was, that was deeply interesting. Um, I, also, I also found very interesting his whole thing about the inversion of angel and devil. Um, I felt deeply what he was saying. Um, on all sorts of levels, on color levels, perception levels, um, who is really the angel, who is really the devil. Um, I, I think that uh, also what he says about the death of whites, of white people in, 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 in world struggles, when it's uh, white people who die, it is the death of white people, and it take, has more significance than when it is the death of black people. Totally, totally current. All you have to do is look at the Ebola case. One black guy, one white guy dies in, in where, is it in America, where was it? One white guy dies, makes headline news all over the world. Big deal. Hundreds of black, black people are dying and Africans are dying. It's, it's not a major case. It is still one white person dies that it becomes an issue. So the key points that Malcolm X was making is still with us. We, are, we haven't gone much further than 1964. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. And is the BBC here by any chance? The BBC should be filming this. <laughs> um, I think also, maybe, maybe the last point I want to make is that um, when he talks about, I've always, been, I've always thought that his phrase, by any means necessary, was always used only in relation to the black community that black people, because they're being subjected to such profound and unacceptable injustice, should use any means necessary. But this is the first time in which I got the fact that he meant by any means necessary from both sides. The government has to use any means necessary to bring about justice. I, that was a very, very powerful thing because I, because I always thought it was a one-sided thing, but the, by any means necessary was his gold standard, his earth standard, his blood standard of justice. The government, all governments, have to use any means necessary to protect its minorities. Finally, uh, there's a one word he mentioned earlier that I just want to amplify, and it's the word creativity. Uh, um, that we use this great, fantastic creativity of the human spirit to justify division, oppression, that we use this great creativity to create separation between us is, I think, one of the great shames of the, of, of the human race. This great creativity we have ought to be used to explode our possibilities, to explode our freedoms. I think his belief, his dream, which was both religious and personal, is that actually, we can create an extraordinary world if we put our will and if we do it, if we want to do it by any means necessary. So I want to reamplify by any means necessary. Let us take forward, let us take forward the fight for freedom and for justice. Thank you all very much. <laughs>